following program is a peer-to-peer -peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. Hello, listeners on Saga 960 AM and those listening around the world on streaming and podcast services. This is It's Not Therapy. I'm Leanna Kersner and... I'm not a therapist, but I am your source for practical advice for everyday problems, using my top 10 sayings for checking in with your best self. This episode, we're going to do something a little different. We're going to examine a social issue from a mental health perspective. We're going to talk about navigating cancel culture because I've had a lot of conversations about it this week. I touched on it and my personal experiences with it on last week's episode, and ironically, the same person that went after me canceled beloved TV host Graham Norton over the weekend. Yeah, J.K. Rowling got her followers to cancel Graham Norton. Because Graham Norton dared to suggest that entertainment celebrities were not the best voices on social issues. He specifically referenced talking to trans people and their parents. And this, according to J.K. Rowling meant that he supported the rape and murder of women. Don't expect it to make sense. It doesn't. Norton also said that some celebrities such as John Cleese, who complain about cancel culture, actually have problems with accountability. I wonder if Graham Norton has changed his view on that one in light of what happened. But either way, his statement didn't warrant the backlash it received. And that's the problem people have with cancel culture. Sometimes you can totally see why a person got in trouble. You agree that they should get in trouble. Some things deserve trouble. But a lot of times, the punishment doesn't fit the crime. Things seem completely unfair. And that unfairness, that sense that the bottom could drop out at any time for a relatively small thing is what has people, especially younger people, so afraid. So I'm gonna break down cancel culture tonight. We're gonna talk about its imprecise definitions, its mental health impacts, and what you can do about it with the intent of getting you that sense of control back. Because a sense of control over your life is so important. Remember, top 10 phrase, healthy goals are based on things that you can control right? So if you've got a question inspired by that epi this episode, give me a call, 289-275-9600, 289-275-9600, or email me, liana at nottherapyshow.com, that's L-I-A-N as in Nancy A, at nottherapyshow.com, or nottherapyshow on Twitter and Instagram. Twitter and Instagram is where I get a lot of my questions from these days. So, cancel culture, what is it? It totally depends on who you ask, and that's the first problem. A huge part of the fight around cancel culture is a frustrating argument of definition. Some people use cancel culture and call-out culture synonymously. Essentially, it's just the practice of calling attention to perceived bad behavior. But the average person tends to see cancel culture as more serious than just a public scolding. Cancel culture hinges on ostracism. The target of the cancellation being shunned, fired, or dropped by a sponsor. And obviously this is already a big, messy definition with a lot of variables. But then we get into the layers of politicization around the term. Cancellation, as we're using it now, comes from the vernacular of Black America, going all the way to that movie New Jack City, Remember that movie, New Jack City? I think it was in the 90s. Back then, cancellation or you've been canceled were definitely a reference to appropriate consequences for bad behavior. But then white American conservatives got hold of the term the same way they got hold of the black vernacular term woke and ironically subjected it to a semantic bleaching. So on black Twitter, canceled can just mean someone's done with you. On white Twitter, especially white conservative Twitter, cancellation is an infringement of freedom of speech by a mob. 
And yes, it's very confusing that there are different types of Twitter. Those are not the only two types of Twitter. How do you find it? it, it it's, it's just the conversations happening in a certain space. Social media, it's like the pirate code. It's more like guidelines. <laughs> There's no real rules in that way. Now, this doesn't mean that everybody on black Twitter, or white Twitter, or Desi Twitter, or any other kind of Twitter is in agreement regarding these meanings or anything to do with them. Barack Obama and a co-founder of Black Lives Matter have spoken out against cancel culture. And meanwhile, many white opinion writers have tried to downplay the significance of cancel culture or insist that it's not real. These opinion writers are mainly on the left. The American and Canadian conservative movements have definitely abused the term. And applying the concept only to celebrities has meant that we've collectively lost the plot regarding the damage that being targeted by outraged anonymous online accounts can do to a regular person's psychological well-being. As a mental health advocate, my primary concern with cancel culture is that it's fundamentally rooted in shame as opposed to an examination of facts or an attempt to truly understand what a person meant. And based on this, obviously I can't condone the practice of cancellation. There's also the problem of the legitimate fear that it breeds. Now, you may not agree with that fear. You may not think the fear is based on something real. But the fear is valid. And again, from a mental health perspective, you can disagree with the reasons for the feeling, but you validate the feeling, right? People aren't soothed by, if you didn't do anything wrong, you have nothing to worry about. Because they've seen people be cancelled for 10-year-old tweets. What's considered appropriate changes a lot in 10 years. Trust me, I'll talk about my past career later. <laughs> Jeez, 10 years is a long time in terms of culture. Now, proponents of cancel culture insist that cancel culture checks power and gives voice to the voiceless, that accountability culture that Graham Norton referenced. And while that may have been true at one time and is still true sometimes, it seems more and more that the power to cancel someone is consolidated in the hands of people like J.K. Rowling, High-profile personalities with millions of followers who are connected to some fairly extreme political groups. And J.K. Rowling increasingly has turned her sights on low-level government workers, college professors, and, well, people like me. And okay, I'm in the media. I accept a certain level of this stuff with the job. But a low-level government outreach worker? Come on. The ironic thing about J.K. Rowling going after me was it was because I pointed out that she's reversed her position on cancel culture. J.K. Rowling was one of the 153 public figures who signed what became known as a letter on justice and open debate, an essay published in Harper's Bazaar that denounced an intolerance of opposing views a vogue for public shaming and ostracism, and the tendency to dissolve complex policy issues in a blinding moral certainty. The letter said, Editors are fired for running controversial pieces. Books are withdrawn for alleged inauthenticity. Journalists are barred from writing on certain topics. Professors are investigated for quoting works of literature in class. A researcher is fired for circulating a peer-reviewed academic study. And the heads of organizations are ousted for what are sometimes just clumsy mistakes. The restrictions of debate, whether by a repressive government or an intolerant society, invariably hurts those who lack power and makes everyone less capable of democratic participation. And we need to preserve the possibility of good faith disagreement without dire professional consequences. The letter made clear that if we won't defend the very thing on which our work depends, we shouldn't expect the public or the state to defend it for us. And now J.K. Rowling is canceling people, including those researchers organizations. She even tried to cancel an entire social media service by claiming it enabled pedophiles. Now, of course, this 
you know, letter on justice and open debate was drafted, signed and published when it was Donald Trump who had the cancellation bully pulpit. Now that J.K. Rowling cares so very sincerely about where transgender women pee, it's okay when she does it. And in a just world, she should probably be expected to explain the reasons for her reversal. But she doesn't have to because she just cancels a few people who criticize her particularly effectively. And that gets set as an example to everyone else. Everyone runs scared. And she's actually being referred to on Twitter now as the children's author. So people don't see what people are saying when they search her name. It's that big a culture of fear. She's become you know who of Twitter. Irony, irony, irony. And this illustrates the central problem with cancel culture. It isn't really about an examination of facts or an attempt to get someone to see the error of their ways. It's an attempt to punish, to cut people off from their jobs, associations, and social circles. It's not corrective. It's vengeance. And ultimately, this doesn't hurt the very wealthy and powerful anywhere near as much as it does regular people. Which is why every modern democratic system has sought to protect minority opinion and unpopular views. But how big a risk is it? What happens when you get canceled? I'll get into that after the break. If you need some help recovering from a cancellation, reach out to me, 289-275-9600. That's 289-275-9600. Or you can email me, liana at nottherapyshow.com. That's L-I-A-N as in Nancy A at nottherapyshow.com. Or Twitter, Instagram, the home of cancellation, at nottherapyshow. We'll be back in a bit. The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on It's Not Therapy. I am still Leanna Kersner. I am still not a therapist. I am still post-cancellation, and that's what we're talking about tonight. We're talking cancel culture. What happens when it happens to you? If you have questions, give me a call, 289-275-9600, 289-275-9600, or email me, liana at nottherapyshow.com, or Twitter, Instagram, at nottherapyshow. Go into the lion's den of social media and cancel culture. Now, I have some younger personal clients, one-on-one clients, people in their 20s and early 30s, and they're terrified about cancel culture. Older people are wary of it. But younger people in that millennial and Gen Z cohort, okay, older millennials are more established, but you know what I mean? Those people who have career paths and social circles that are much less established, it completely makes sense why they'd be afraid. The idea that you can have your job, reputation, and social group destroyed by a false accusation or something that's true but completely blown out of proportion is absolutely not an abstraction for this age group. They've seen or heard it happen to someone or they've already had it happen to them. So telling them that it's not real or that it's just accountability culture, well, that's gaslighting. I've got clients who won't speak up in their college classes because they're afraid of cancel culture. They won't socialize, start conversations, or do effective networking. And it's easy to say, suck it up, until you've seen the legitimate dread in these young adults. I have one client that just describes it as existential dread. I have other clients who can't set boundaries. And you know how I feel about boundaries. Top 10. Other people don't have to like your boundaries, but they do have to respect them. And that means you have to set them. But many clients, a lot of female clients, they can't set boundaries because they think that mistakes are no different than intentional manipulations. And they recognize that they've made mistakes and that they don't set boundaries because they think that their less than perfect moments mean that they don't deserve to be treated well. 
And that's because every mistake has such dire consequences and people never learn how to make mistakes well and recover from them. It's a major life skill. That's why I talk about perfection being a lie. Stop trying to be perfect, but I get it. I get it why people feel the need to be perfect in this climate. Because these young adults have been raised in a culture of shame where they've never learned to recover from being less than perfect. They're so focused on the things they mess up. They don't put any time or, or you know, any effort into validating the things they do well. Shame makes people do irrational, illogical things. It's impossible to be logical with shame brain. While the conscious brain, the rational brain, recognizes intellectually that there's certain things that you need to do to succeed, shame brain cuts you off from that logic. And when it seems like the rules are constantly changing and the penalty for breaking those rules is punishing, shame mixes with fear and makes people shut down and do things against their own best interests. I work with clients to get them to take a series of small risks so that they get some early victories and build confidence. But the baby steps have to be so tiny because the fear brain and the shame brain, well, they're in charge. And it's really easy to dismiss this sort of thing, to tell people to just suck it up. But come on, they want to. If they could, they would. No one wants to be paralyzed by fear, especially when it comes to human contact. And that paralysis is a result of a solid decade of cancel culture. We're seeing the results of a generation raised in it and there are emotional casualties. And that's not a tragedy just for those people. We're losing good ideas. We're losing innovation. We're losing work because people are frozen. Being constantly vigilant and never being able to relax around people for whatever the reason isn't good. An anti-workplace bullying account I follow on Twitter puts it this way. Find people who you trust with your eyes closed and your back turned. And that really is the goal. But Gen Z has been raised to believe in many cases that this isn't realistic. It isn't realistic to find people who you trust with your eyes closed and your back turned. The constant threat of being canceled does change behaviors. It changes attitudes. People don't say when something bothers them. They don't ask questions so they can improve. And they become so afraid of being wrong that they can't admit when they are. I did a live stream over the weekend where I got the best non-apology apology from a chatter ever who attacked my mental health. The line, and I can't say the full word I think on radio, but you can, you can fill it in. Um, but it was, I was not an a-hole and hole was, hole was spelt W-H-O-L-E. I was not an a-hole, but I'm sorry if it seemed like I was. If you never admit you're wrong, you can't grow as a person. And yeah, if you go around dropping non-apology apologies, people are going to think that you're an a-hole in multiple spellings. But conventional wisdom regarding cancellation is that the best thing to do is defiantly state that you've done nothing wrong and insist that the whole thing is just a witch hunt. And that's what Matt Walsh did when footage of him surfaced insisting that there's no problem with a 16-year-old getting pregnant as long as they're married. If you don't know who Matt Walsh is, that's okay. You can probably figure out the type of dude he is by context. But Matt Walsh refused to apologize for, yeah, at, at benefit of the doubt, really poor wording. He even called his critics sick freaks. Of course, Matt Walsh is not exactly seen as an upstanding citizen by the mainstream. 
And his comments are not exactly off brand for his frequent pandering to religious conservatives. But he's not the only one. And every so often, one of his ideas gets traction, even if people think he's bad. And that's the whole purpose of guys like Matt Walsh. Kanye West, Donald Trump, they're still going. Despite the outrage about comments they've made about Jews and almost every other identifiable group. And yeah, both got kicked off Twitter. But strangely enough, they're still getting their ravings into public awareness. Dave Chappelle is selling out shows. James Gunn is bigger than ever. A lot of people don't remember that he was ever canceled. And admittedly, at least in my opinion, that whole thing was ridiculous. Joe Rogan, biggest streamer on Spotify, keeps insisting things that never actually happened happened to a friend's wife. Now, you have to be inclined to believe some pretty nutty things when you believe a story like children in public schools are claiming to be cats and they're being provided with litter boxes. That was something Joe Rogan repeated on a recent episode. And there are people out there like Joe Rogan that insist they have evidence that it happened. But their evidence tends to be TikTok videos of someone saying it happened. It tends to be that I know a guy who knows a guy who knows a guy, which usually means it's not true. Ezra Miller, still in the flash, despite facing a burglary charge. Mel Gibson is showing up in movies again. People are going to have to decide when they think about seeing Aquaman 2 whether they believe Johnny Depp or Amber Heard and what that means for their purchasing decisions. And I suspect Will Smith will eventually make another movie someday. Now, Will Smith is the exception here because he physically smacked Chris Rock on an internationally broadcasted award show. So there's no way to claim that footage was faked, taken out of context, or otherwise manipulated or misread. It seems that if there's any degree of subjectivity whatsoever, things go kind of crazy. All the examples I just gave of the people who were canceled and got through it, they're all men. And, and you know, okay, Amber Heard's still an Aquaman, but I think she's finished after Aquaman. It just, you can't, you can't survive some of the stuff that's out there about her, right? And this is why J.K. Rowling is so culturally significant. J.K. Rowling is the only woman I can think of who's withstood cancellation. Roseanne Barr got canceled for doing much less. And you can think what Roseanne Barr said was wrong and disgusting. That's fair. But it was way less than J.K. Rowling has said. And then there's the notorious case of Gina Carano, who got hounded for months about putting pronouns in her bio, only to get officially canceled for invoking the Holocaust. The claim that circulated was that she was comparing being a conservative to being a Jewish person during World War II, but she didn't actually outright say that. Her message was more general about hating anyone for having differing political views. It was a general statement, not, I'm so harmed, right? Now, okay, granted, Gina Carano's political views included conspiracy theories. Like the idea that the 2020 U.S. election had voter, a lot of voter fraud and that Jeffrey Epstein didn't die by suicide. I see the position of major media companies that they maybe don't want talent weighing in on those things. And they're still figuring out where the line is. The internal conversations that I'm aware of have been quite fraught. But this disinformation, this idea of a sincerely held belief, begs the question, was... Carano a perpetrator here, a truly bad actor, or just the victim of misinformation? 
And more broadly, if even Lucasfilm can't prevent its talent from catching a huge case of brainworms, what hope is there for the rest of us? And a further challenge here is that celebrities' words, rightly or wrongly, do have power. I think that's what Graham Norton was talking about. Celebrities shouldn't be asked for wisdom. You know, playing a guitar, well, doesn't make you smart. But celebrities' words do have power. Hence Graham Norton's comments about an expectation of accountability. There just don't seem to be any reasonable standards for separating when something is stupid and offensive and that's it and when something is potentially dangerous. Now, Joe Rogan and J.K. Rowling, okay, weird, they have the same initials. But anyway, those two are part of a spectrum of misinformation that's leading to regular people being terrorized. A children's hospital in Boston is getting bomb threats because libs of TikTok claimed without evidence that they were doing unnecessary surgery on the genitals of minors. A crisis line for trans youth had to be shut down because of harassment, because of similar, not totally substantiated claims. A Canadian Twitch streamer had to temporarily move to Ireland because an online troll group decided that she needed to be cancelled. And a school in Oakville, Ontario was swarmed by protests before the system had time to work because a single teacher who happened to appear to be transgender wore some inadvisable outfits. And that's led to a teacher I know, somebody I actually know, not a friend of a friend's wife like Joe Rogan, a guy I actually know, being harassed because he wore jeans to teach high school chemistry. Yep, wearing jeans to a job at a high school is now an online crime. And this is why I don't have guests on this episode. I don't want anybody else to be canceled for things I say here. Now, here's the thing. You can think any of these things I just mentioned are awful, okay? You can be outraged by it. But you're outraged because there are minors involved. And when minors are involved, it's more important than ever for everyone to keep their heads and just solve the problem. When you're contributing to adults screaming at each other in schools in full view of the students, and that's children's hospitals, youth outreach, anything like that, when adults are losing it at each other in front of minors, you are potentially traumatizing those young people. I went to university a year earlier because I skipped a grade. And in my first year, there was a faculty strike. And I had to cross a picket line to get to class. And professors I recognized were pounding on the hood of my car, screaming obscenities at me for crossing the picket line because there were some teachers that didn't support the strike and were still holding class. It was terrifying. It was so terrifying that I had to pull my car over because the whole thing triggered a panic attack. University had been sold to me by my high school teachers as the place where my intelligence would finally be appreciated. And it was anything but. And that was a, a real lesson. Even when you're not physically harmed, words can hurt, yelling can hurt, aggression can hurt. People just seeming completely out of control. E you know, even if it's nothing personal, even if you're just the object it's being taken out on, well, that's the problem. It's, it's painful. It's terrifying. And there needs to be some system to stop bullies. But cancel culture isn't it. It never has been, even when it was expressed as literal witch hunts and burning people at the stake. I mean, let's take Joan of Arc, right? Back in the day, 1431, right? Joan of Arc's crimes for which she was executed for heresy were having visions and dressing like a man. Specifically, 
dressing like a soldier. You know, Joan of Arc might be one of history's greatest cancellations. And I think up until the last period or so, we'd look back on it as something we got past in that way. But now we have to wonder if those uglier, more reactive parts of human nature ever really went away, whether they weren't just controlled by systems that have sort of gone haywire, some guardrails have failed, and we're all paying the consequences for it. And this is why I say those who say cancel culture isn't real are wrong. The harming of regular people, defaming, smearing, lies, political persecutions have always existed. Black Twitter just gave them a catchy name and the extra layer of, you know, sometimes people deserve it. And again, when Black Twitter did it, it was about deserving it. It's broken containment there as well. This is the problem with culture via meme. Meaning gets lost in the repetition. If cancel culture were just about accountability, if people could see the way through navigating it, people wouldn't be so afraid. The fact that people are so afraid indicates that it's not just accountability culture. Something more is going on here. But what's it like to be canceled? I'll share my own experiences and what I learned from them after the break. And if you have questions inspired by this episode, give me a call, 289-275-9600. That's 289-275-9600. Or email liana at nottherapyshow.com. L-I-A-N is in Nancy A at nottherapyshow.com. Or Twitter, Instagram where I battle it out on a regular basis at Not Therapy Show. We'll be back after this. The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on It's Not Therapy talking cancel culture. And I'm going to talk more in depth about my own experiences with it. These experiences are why I have a wealth of life experience to draw on when I give advice. I've had a lot of past careers. I was on a racy late night show. That got me branded a dumb slut. Then I was run out of that TV station because bullies leveraged that perception to brand me unprofessional and difficult to work with after I was assaulted in the workplace. None of it was true, and I had evidence, but they didn't care. And if you sued back then, well, nobody did sue because it meant that you'd never work again. Frankly, in Canada, it still means you'll probably never work in media again. It's still a problem. So after that, I worked as a video game journalist. And then Gamergate happened. And I decided to do my job and actually talk to the people insisting that games journalists were the scum of the earth, even though I obviously didn't agree with them. I thought they had a few valid concerns that dialogue could ameliorate. And yes, I'm distancing myself from this with big words because that got me canceled by both the Breitbart forces of the alt-right who were attempting to convert gamers to their cause via wedge issues and the left. Now, before I move on to the left, I just want to say on the whole, the Breitbart strategy to convert gamers failed pretty miserably. But the left was so afraid of it that they canceled me for even talking to Gamergators and reporting on what they said. Yes, I was double canceled by both sides of the culture war in the same period between 2014 and 2015. I was branded literally the devil because I was a reporter who was primarily interested in the facts instead of the noise. I was doxxed. Multiple false articles were written about me. Certain contingents were actively trying to get me to kill myself. But I wasn't a proper victim. I didn't want articles right being written about how hard I had it. I had to recuse myself from coverage and just write opinion because I became part of the story. 
And because I didn't play victim properly, it was impossible to get work in games reporting after that. Now, I don't know if no matter what, people just didn't want to be around that, but I was branded too polarizing. And what I understood it came down to was that the left-wing forces in gaming were trying to build a narrative about harassment of women in gaming, and I didn't want to be treated like a woman. I wanted to be treated like a reporter. And that just ran counter to their narrative. And of course, the right, well, <laughs> there's no way, man. I'm just too left-wing. They just wanted to burn me to the ground. What's interesting is that a couple of left-wing editors who were openly sexist to me in private are now working at major media outlets. They're smart enough to pull stuff using coded language, knowing that anything but sexual harassment is still not something women can openly talk about and be seen as anything but a bitter complainer. And that means you have to go full victim to get a hearing and it's impossible to keep your dignity. Remember I pointed out that men tend to have better outcomes with cancel culture than women do? That's why. Men are allowed to be much more polarizing. Think about all the guys who say ridiculous, deliberately offensive stuff as part of their brand. Joe Rogan, Ricky Gervais, Bill Maher, Howard Stern, even Trevor Noah and John Oliver say some contentious stuff. When they do that, the media companies backing them know they can usually wait out any firestorm. But there are reasons that you can't name a female equivalent to any of those male personalities. This is a massive problem that I've identified with cancel culture. It's designed to maintain status quo. And yes, there are exceptions to this rule, right? But look at the difference between treatment of Kevin Hart at the Oscars and Dave Chappelle on Netflix. It's all about whether the companies had their backs. I mean, even Joan of Arc back in the day was later rehabilitated in a second trial. Too bad she was dead and that really didn't matter to her. It's all about institutions. It's all about structures and who's allowed to do what. And that's maddening. And it can have a really damaging impact on someone's mental health when they encounter that nonsensical unfairness. Now, I don't have time to get into my other experiences with cancellation. It's not important. It's very much lather, rinse, repeat, and it's just depressing. The point is that cancel culture doesn't elevate the marginalized because cancel culture plays on dog whistles and stereotypes with the smokescreen of punching up. But the reality is that what you can say in public and what you can't say is hugely dependent on what you look like. If you're white and male, you can say things that say black women can't. You can't, however, ever complain that you feel objectified or sexually demeaned, as Kit Harrington found out back in 2016. Yeah, Jon Snow got cancelled once. It's extremely hard to keep track of who can say what. And it's easy to just blame the left, but that's not based in reality. The right wing is going after plenty of regular people. Again, the cat litter thing. Directed at attacking LGBTQ plus educators. Critical race theory. School boards, schools, libraries. They're all getting dogpiled and people are afraid. It's all the political extremes. You can't lay the blame neatly at the feet of one group. And when you're wealthy, you can wait out the rage. That's why J.K. Rowling can basically say whatever she wants. She gets checks for doing nothing these days. That theme park in the U.S. is paying for her castle in Scotland. But if you're living paycheck to paycheck, a rough six months can be catastrophic. And then you have to face all the rejection repeatedly when you Put yourself out there again. While rich celebrities have agents handling the rejection, at least in large part, for them. From where I sit, cancel culture is not most effective at speaking truth to power. It's most effective at making regular people miserable and terrified. I get that there are many groups that are frustrated at the double standards, so they take shortcuts, but in the long run, it's only hurting the people they advocate for. I mean... What was the main plot structure for She-Hulk? Jen getting cancelled over and over and over again. And then the show totally dodged any resolution that showed her overcoming the damage to her reputation. And that piece of the puzzle, that overcoming it, is so essential to true equality and equity. 
because of those double standards still existing. People who aren't white cisgender men can't use the same tactics as those guys do. And that's no one's fault. It just is. Because again, cancel culture is rooted in stereotypes. On certain things, you're subjected to guilty until proven innocent. Because something about your identity has been effectively stereotyped and demonized. With me, it was always, it's always been that I'm a slut or a liar or a shill or a grifter. Because women lie, right? I just wanted attention. I was too emotional. I was trying to ruin someone. It's a stereotype that even so-called left-wing allies apply because it works. Now, I know I told the truth. I told the truth. No matter how many times someone claims I lied, I know I told the truth. But I also have to live with the reality that pretty significant people didn't care that I was telling the truth. And I suffered accordingly. And I'll share how I did that after the break. Hold on for just a few minutes. We'll be back on It's Not Therapy with the stunning conclusion that she hulk dodged. Back in a bit. The following program is a peer-to-peer advice show and does not diagnose mental health conditions. If you're seeking social services, please call or text 211 or go to 211.ca. We're back on It's Not Therapy, and as promised, I'm going to give you tips for how to survive cancellation. Now, stuff happens in life. Job losses happen. People lie about you. Things happen that are unfair. But cancellation is different because of the mass scale of it. Cancellation destroys your belief that the world is fair and the truth matters. And that turns you into your own worst enemy by making you unable to trust And dealing with the pain of people cutting you off because they can't take the heat. Or worse, they believe the lies about you. A lot of my top 10 phrases were developed through my experiences dealing with cancellation. So here's the how-to guide to survive it using my top 10 phrases. Top 10 phrase one, don't let problems that aren't your fault lead to mistakes that are. Being canceled is painful. It's angering. It's terrifying but resist the urge to lash out because of your completely valid feelings. People aren't going to understand. People want easy answers and simple solutions. So don't give them anything aggressive to chew on. That's in your control. And you know what I say about control. Healthy goals are based on things you can control. You can't control the opinions of other people. Like I said, you're probably going to lose a few friends and colleagues. And in the long run... That's okay. They didn't have your back. They didn't believe in you. They didn't believe you. Remember, you want people around you that you can trust with your eyes closed and your back turned. All you can control is your own behavior. You might get fired. But you can choose to get fired for something that wasn't true or fair or get fired because you did something stupid because you were emotionally off balance. You might not get a chance to explain. No one might listen to you. You can't control that. You can control your inner world. So get balance. And I'll tell you now, the stuff I've just said, you're going to mess it up in some way. No one has absolute control, even though we have some control, right? Getting canceled is a trauma. Trauma impacts the brain, affects our judgment, and damages our impulse control. The first time you go through it, you're going to screw it up. I did. And that's okay. I'm giving you permission to screw it up because no one's perfect. Top 10 phrase, stop trying to be perfect. Perfect is a lie. Being canceled is a great opportunity to change your image. Loosen up some. Let people see the real you, quirks and all. If you do it now before you're canceled, it'll make you more likely to survive a cancellation because your baseline is much more authentic. One of the things about being canceled is you find out who your friends really are. And so it's an opportunity to change how you interact with people. And if you make a mistake, admit it. Yes, some people will never let you live it down, but it shows other people that you're willing to own your mistakes. 
So they're more likely to believe you when you dig in on other things. But the internal demands for perfection are actually more damaging than the opinions of others. Every mistake is going to destroy you if you try to be perfect as opposed to just doing your best. That's why I say, top 10, self-esteem cannot exist without self-compassion. The thing about cancellation is there's at least a tiny shred of something real in the accusation. The stuff that's built up around it might be false or you might be totally guilty of what you're accused of. And if that's so, nothing you can do about it but own it and learn from it. And that's where self-compassion comes in. We need to forgive ourselves to step out of shame. If we fall into denial because we can't handle the mistakes we've made, that's when we start subscribing to conspiracies. And the further you go down that road, the harder it is to come back because admitting just how wrong you were gets harder and harder to do because it strikes at the core of your sense of self as a good person. Cancellations are so much easier to get through if you like yourself and you're gentle with yourself. You can admit fault without accepting abuse. Top 10 phrase, others don't have to like your boundaries. They do have to respect them. Name calling isn't fair criticism. It's totally fair for someone to take issue with your behavior. It's not okay for someone to attack you for something you can't control, like your race, your gender, your gender identity, your sexuality. Learning and validating those lines makes troll attacks so much easier to deal with because the minute someone crosses those lines, block them in real life and online. Getting canceled from a group like that might be doing you a favor because top 10, you're the hero of your own story and not anyone else's. Someone might never forgive you for what you did. Okay, that's their story. So they won't be a part of yours anymore. Like I said, that's okay. Other supporting characters will come along. Heroes have setbacks. Heroes are misunderstood. Heroes take it on the chin and get on with things. Villains are the ones that get obsessed with revenge. Taking the high road when you're getting attacked and maintaining a sincere sense of humor about it are essential for getting through these defamation sessions. Within about 72 hours, if you don't feed the beast, the worst is usually over. The mobs moved on to another target and you get your life back. After that, if someone's still giving you a hard time, cut them out. They're a toxic person. And I am out of time. I wish I could give more tips. There's lots more. But that's why next week we are going to do an entire episode on resiliency. You're not going to want to miss that. Until then, you know what I'm going to say. You're crazy. And all the crazy around you is only a problem if it's hurting you. Take care and be good to yourself until next week. Bye for now.